The first topic under physiology is cardiac output. Cardiac output is very clinically important for patients, and it's often something that we follow to see if a patient is improving or worsening in their therapy. Cardiac output, the formula, is very important to remember, and that is stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume measured in milliliters, and heart rate measured in beats per minute. It's important to remember this equation for the exam. Clinically, we tend to measure cardiac output by the Fick equation, and the Fick equation is shown here as cardiac output equals the rate of oxygen consumption divided by the difference between the arterial oxygen content minus the venous O2 content. The Fick equation is generally considered the most reliable method we have of measuring cardiac output clinically. Cardiac output can also be used in a modified form of Ohm's law, which is shown here, and that is mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Remember that the formula for mean arterial pressure is equal to two-thirds times the diastolic pressure plus one-third times the systolic pressure. And this is because the cardiac cycle is made up of two-thirds diastole and one-third systole. The formula for pulse pressure, which you should also be aware of, is systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. Pulse pressure generally is considered proportional stroke volume, and that is as stroke volume increases, so does the pulse pressure. Another formula for the stroke volume is that stroke volume is equal to cardiac output divided by heart rate, which is equal to the end diastolic volume of the left ventricle minus the end systolic volume of the left ventricle. You should remember all of these formulas as you will be tested on them. Most likely they will give you the values that are given in each of these equations, but it will be up to you to remember these equations. During exercise, an increase in cardiac output generally is a result of an increase in stroke volume. And that increased stroke volume is due to increased sympathetic tone, which causes increased inotropy, or increased contractility of the left ventricle. And this causes an increased cardiac output. However, after prolonged exercise, the cardiac output increases as a result of the increase in heart rate. And that increased cardiac output is very important so that we can continue to exercise. If the heart rate, however, becomes too high, Diastolic filling will be incomplete, that is, the heart will not have enough time during diastole to completely fill the chamber of the left ventricle, and at that time, cardiac output will diminish. An example of this is during ventricular tachycardia, when the heart rate can approach 200 to 300 beats per minute. And if this occurs, the heart does not have enough time to fill between beats, and therefore cardiac output will drop, and therefore blood pressure will drop as well. Next, we will discuss some of the variables regarding cardiac output, and the first of those shown here is stroke volume. As you can see, stroke volume is affected by contractility, afterload, and preload. Stroke volume increases with an increased preload. This is also known as the Frank-Starling mechanism. Stroke volume also increases with a decreased afterload. This is because the heart has less to pump against and is therefore able to pump more blood out per beat. Remember that afterload is approximately equal to aortic pressure. As aortic pressure increases, the heart has to work harder and stroke volume would drop. Stroke volume also increases with an increased contractility. Remember that contractility has to do with the intracellular concentration of calcium in cardiac myocytes. The mnemonic for this is SV-CAP. Contractility, afterload, and preload all affect stroke volume. There are four variables here that affect contractility and therefore stroke volume. The first of those is catecholamines, such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. Catecholamines, by their receptor activity and downstream signaling, increase the activity of calcium pumps in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
As these pumps increase their activity, the amount of calcium inside the cell increases, and therefore stroke volume will increase. As extracellular sodium drops via the decreased activity of the sodium calcium exchanger, contractility will also increase. Digitalis, the fourth variable shown here, increases the concentration of intracellular sodium by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase. This results in an increased intracellular calcium concentration. That increased intracellular calcium concentration causes an increased actin myosin cross bridging and therefore causes increased contractility. Remember that contractility is directly related to the calcium concentration inside the cell. Contractility and stroke volume decrease with the following variables. The first is beta-1 blockade. Remember that the beta-1 receptor is located on all cardiac muscle cells. And as the beta-1 receptor is blocked, this drops the intracellular calcium concentration. And this causes a decrease in actin myosin cross bridging and therefore causes a decrease in contractility. Heart failure can also affect contractility, specifically systolic heart failure, where the heart has lost the ability to pump and has a worsening ejection fraction. There are many causes of heart failure, which we won't discuss now, but in general, patients with systolic heart failure have decreased contractility due to many different causes. Acidosis is another cause of decreased contractility. The mechanism by which acidosis causes decreased contractility is to prevent cross-bridging of actin and myosin. Contractility also decreases with hypoxia and hypercapnia, as well as administration of non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil and diltiazem. Stroke volume can increase in anxiety, exercise, and pregnancy, whereas a failing heart has a decreased stroke volume. We often discuss myocardial oxygen demand. Basically what this term means is how much oxygen the heart is using per minute. This is important because if the demand outweighs the supply, this can cause a heart attack. An increase in myocardial oxygen demand is caused by, first, an increased afterload, which is directly related to aortic or arterial blood pressure, as well as increased contractility and increased heart rate. Both of these affect myocardial oxygen demand. Also, which is commonly seen in heart failure, an increased heart size also cause an increased myocardial oxygen demand. This is due to the law of Laplace, which states that as the heart size increases, the amount of wall tension also increases.